Welcome to Fort Worth 148's podcast, where we meet to discuss Masonic topics and strive to build value in the Brotherhood. The opinions and statements of the participants do not represent any positions or stance of any Grand Lodge or Lodge, and are solely the viewpoints of the participants. Welcome back to the podcast, gentlemen. This is Rent Moore, past master and current secretary of Fort Worth 148. This is Billy Hamilton, senior steward for 148. And this is Gabriel Yagish, Master Mason with 148. Well, it's good to be back, boys. This week has been crazy. It has. I'm still recovering from family day. <laughs> I'm, t- I'm telling you. Uh <clears throat> that event, the barbecue cook-off, I didn't make it to family day. I had a family reunion, but the the barbecue cook-off is something else. I have a better time every year. Yeah, and I I tell you what, I think I, you know, I had a lot of fun on Saturday, but Friday night was where it was really at. Um, you know, the, it's just such good fellowship. To be able to just, you know, go from, from tent to tent, really, and just talk with brothers from all over the state, you know, sample some, some great food. Without a doubt, I got my chicken fried bake, bacon fix, which is <laughs> very famous out there. But I mean, we were up. I finally left about two thirty, two forty-five in the morning, and guys stayed up well past that, uh, if not all night. Just yeah. chit chatting about Freemasonry. About, um, I stayed up until about six a.m. and then I went. And I took a nap, and then I came back to the main tent and you know kind of sat there and snoozed in a lawn chair for a little bit but oh man next time i'm bringing a cot yeah and here's the thing if you haven't been to this barbecue cook-off you gotta make it uh i there was definitely more people there that were not competing just coming out eating the food uh because they're just giving it out left and right uh and fellowshipping and certainly smoking a lot of cigars (laughs) On my way home, I smelled like barbecue smoke and cigar smoke, a mixture. Uh, it was greatness. No doubt a good time. So make plans. If not, I know the like James Dallas and a couple other guys were, were already planning to put together a smoker so they can compete next year. And guys have $50,000 rigs out there to $50 rigs. There's, you know, they're just out there having a good time smoking briskets. I mean, I saw one guy that had the little smoky out there. So you can you can compete if you want. It doesn't cost a lot. Yeah, the coolest smoker setup that I saw was being towed by an RV, and the whole thing and the smoker setup was almost as big as the RV. It was crazy. oh, that was a that was a mobile kitchen. That, it did just happen to have a smoker on it. <laughs> yeah. That was from Lufkin Lufkin Lodge, I believe. Ah, okay, yeah, because I remember looking at that and just being absolutely blown away. Oh man, I was so peanut butter and jealous because that, I mean, they had griddle, cooktop, fryer, f- a huge fan, <laughs> sink. Man, can you imagine you if we had it. something it was awesome. like that? It would be incredible. Yeah. It was wicked co. Cool. So. Let's talk questions. We got any listener questions this week? Yes, we do. Let's talk, li- let's talk questions. Let's do it. So the first question that I have, and both of these are stolen from Reddit, so, you know, shout out of to course. the Freemasonry subreddit. Yeah, I, um, these are all kind of a mix of, you know, things I find on Reddit, things I find on Facebook, things people ask me in person. Every once in a while we'll get a Facebook message, but, you know, mostly these are just general questions. But the first question I have is, are polytheists welcome? And, uh... Um. It I don't depends. think that is technically legal, so, <laughs> but I've seen the debate. I've just never seen the proof. So it this is one of those it depends kind of things. Um, I, th- I think that's right. I mean, because it comes down. I know in our jurisdiction, it says higher power. Yeah. So it's not plural. I mean, if you want to get real technical. And uh, let me pull up. Let me pull up a uh, Texas Masonic petition just so that I can read the verbiage correctly, but in Texas, I don't, you know, polytheism, I think you're still technically good, but you have to have a book. 
So, uh, um, coming from ahead. Oklahoma, right? Like we were told that uh, you had to be from a monotheistic religion. So, really, Christianity, um, you know, Judaism, Islam, and then I. At like so, the question came up: What about Hindu brothers? And we were told no because they're polytheistic. But I have heard of Hindu brothers in Texas. So to be honest, I'm not sure. And it may vary based on jurisdiction. So Ooh, that's the truth. That Don't... actually depends on the branch of Hinduism that they belong to, because um, certain branches believe this and certain branches don't. But um, some Hindus believe that all of the gods um, are manifestations of one God. And I might be, you know, kind of talking out of my ass on this one because I'm not as familiar with Hinduism as I would like to be. So my apologies for any of our Hindu brothers that are sitting there shaking their heads at us. Um, But my understanding is that a lot of Hindus believe that all the different gods are emanations of one monotheistic god. Um, When it comes to that, then it would be the duty of the examining, you know, the investigative committee to kind of investigate that and ask yeah, that that was my take. And again, I'm with you. I'm in the same boat you are, Gabe. I've I've researched it very briefly, um, but from what I read, that was kind of the same thing. There was one guy pulling all the strings of the other gods. Yeah. So the phrasing that we use in Texas is: Do you seriously declare upon your honor that you firmly believe in the existence of God? the immortality of the soul, and the divine authenticity of the Holy Scripture. And so, and then you read the Grand Lodge Law Book, and the Grand Lodge says it's not in the Grand Lodge's authority to presume what the Holy Scripture is, specifically, because they're not, you know, they said, well, there's kind of multiple ones for them. But so in Texas, you got to believe in God. you got to ha- believe that the soul is immortal. And you got to have some belief in the divine authenticity of the Holy Scripture. So if, you know, you are Jewish, that would be your, the Tanakh, right? Or if you're Christian, the Bible. Um, I guess um, for other religions, you, it gets kind of more fuzzy for some. You know, it's like if you are, uh, I guess... Uh, heathen, right? And you believe in the North God, Norse gods, not the North gods, and the <laughs> Norse gods, you kind of have to find something that you say, okay, well, I believe that this is divinely authentic because in Texas, that's a requirement. It's not a requirement everywhere else, but I know that in jurisdictions like Oklahoma, uh, which Billy's mentioned, and Massachusetts, a couple other ones, you have to be monotheistic. So, for example, like if you're a satru, that won't fly. Or if you're, um, if you have nat- some Native American beliefs, that might not fly. Um, in Texas, though, yeah. it just says you have to believe in God, capital G. So, I guess you know polytheism is cool. I, there just has to be one that you can designate as God. So, uh, conversation too. Then, what about Wiccans? Because I know some of them believe that the God and the goddess are both like twin aspects of the original, I guess, deity. I'd say that works. Yeah, it would, I guess it would boil down to if they considered them two separate entities. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, again, I'm just not totally for sure. Cause I've, I've asked people that are learned Masons and I've gotten different answers. I've seen it debated on Facebook and old threads and all over the internet, and you never get a clear answer on it. But also bring up an interesting question of what would they use as their holy scripture? Well, I've seen one of those before. Well, uh, or at least I've met a Wiccan with a book that was the book of his faith. Yeah, I mean, I guess... I, I think I still have it. In most cases, it's probably going to be something like the book of... Of the Book of Shadows, um, but it's the problem with the Book of Shadows is that that's more of like a grimoire, and I'm probably saying that wrong, um, but it, it's basically like a cookbook of spells, um, so a, a recipe list essentially, and so it's not really like the Bible 
or the Tanakh or the Gita or the Quran or anything like that. Um, but I guess that would be kind of the book of their faith um, in the sense that... Remind me when we're at Lodge next time. I think that's where I left it because uh, I looked through it. There were no spells. So I'm kind of curious as to what book it was now. That but it's at Lodge. I'm almost out. 100% sure. Yeah. Yeah. What to check that out? Yeah, because it there were no spells that I saw in it. I didn't read it cover to cover, but I looked through it pretty thoroughly. Yeah. Well, uh, and and I hope that we're you know following you know, and I hope that polytheism is allowed because it's it's an interesting perspective. Um, you know, I was at an EEA degree at, at one lodge where um, the candidate was asked a certain question about his um, beliefs and all that and he answered in the old gods and the new which is very games of <laughs> thronesy um right. <laughs> but it turns out you know they were at, you know uh, and you could see people kind of panicking on the sidelines when he said that um but he we talked with him afterwards and it turns out he practices a synchronistic synchronistic i don't know how you say that synchronistic uh, a hybrid he practices a hybrid of uh, Catholicism and Native American folk religion um, because that's what his family practices. Like, ah, cool. Yeah. So I just thought that was really cool, and you know, it's it's different. And so he, you know, because it's a hybrid of Catholicism, he was, uh, you know, he took his obligation on a you know King James Bible. But um, it was kind of interesting because people were going, "Can we even legally do this?" And we we're just kind of going, "Uh, I think so. <laughs> Not a hundred percent." That's probably something you shouldn't find out during the degree, but I know it yeah. happens. <laughs> so, but you know, it's just one of those things. You got it. You so, got it. That's the beauty of this craft, though. It brings together people that are different. You know, you don't have to believe what your brother believes. You just have to give him the freedom to do his thing. Yeah. You'll be better for it. You get experience, little culture. And that's that's something that I'm kind of. Uh, I've been talking with a brother who is really interested in the Knights Templar. And um, if you're listening to this, you know who you are, brother. Um, and uh, this is not a negative call out or anything like that. But, um, you know, he really is, he's really interested in becoming a Knight Templar. But um, the Grand Commandery Law Book, as well as the Grand Encampment Law Book, says that you have to be a Christian. Uh, to be a knight, te- knight Templar. And, um, you know, that's kind of a bummer, you know? Uh, and there is one degree that very specifically requires you to declare uh, your faith in Jesus Christ as the Savior of all mankind, which I was cool with because I'm a Christian, but obviously somebody who is not Christian might have some objections to that, and I totally get it, you know? Um, so... It's sometimes the rules can get in the way of showing brothers a really cool experience. But uh, when it comes to stuff like commandery, for example, um, you know, maybe you wouldn't get as much mileage out of it if you're not a Christian. You know, it's like it's like atheists and and masonry. Um, My kind of go to answer for why aren't atheists allowed in masonry is like you're not going to get as much of it. Or yeah, even any, or even anything out of it. Um, it's kind of, kind of pointless. So, uh, for non Christians, commandery, I don't think. I mean, the ritual is really cool, um, but as far as the values and lessons that the ritual is supposed to inculcate, um, I really don't think you're going to get the mileage out of it, and it's not fair to you or us. So, however, yeah. there are Templar degrees in the Scottish Rite, and you don't have to be a Christian to join the Scottish Rite. So um, go see the Templar degrees in Scottish Rite. They're older than the Knight Templar degrees in Commander anyway. So go watch that. And, and I have heard a story of that there was once a Muslim brother who became a Knight Templar because he, the way it was explained to me, and I'm not sure if this is true or not, I would actually have to do research to see if I could actually find some documented instance of this. But because, um, was explained that you just have to declare that you are willing you are willing to raise your sword in defense of Christianity, not necessarily yourself. Yes, um, there are some 
commandery jurisdictions where um, that is permissible, uh, which is kind of weird because, like, at the state commandery level, that that's permissible. But then when you look at the grand encampment level, that's not permissible. And so some of these commanderies are members of the grand encampment, and so they're it's kind of weird because they're in violation of the grand encampment standard. Um, but then again, I I hate the idea of a national level body, so that's a totally different that's a different level of discussion for another day. But um, I know, uh, I mean, uh, Masonic Roundtable did an episode on this, and there's a couple guys there that are deists, and they are Knight Templar, you know, or Knights Templar, and um, it's they the argument used there is I would you know raise my sword in defense of the Christian faith just like I would in the defense of the Jewish faith or the Muslim faith or anything like that you know because they're defending any any brother's faith. Um, I think in Texas, uh, in Texas, we're specifically asked that we would raise it in preference to the Christian faith before all others. So, yeah, and then. Uh, during the Order of Malta, we're specifically de- declared, we specifically declare a Christian sentiment and on the petition. So, Texas is a little bit more strict about that, but there are some jurisdictions that are a little bit uh, more loosey goosey with that, and um, I think maybe that might be to their benefit. Well, I mean, it is, I think it is cool to have things that are specifically driven for certain aspects of culture. Yeah. I think there's a great benefit to that as well to where, you know, for me, I would love to see something if we had the demand that m- was geared towards Muslim faith, you know, uh, Jewish faith, whatever it may be. Uh, Cause I think it's a great thing that there's an order that requires you to declare your Christian faith. I mean, what a mm-hmm. better, you know, it's a great way to build brotherhood in that body. Yeah, I mean, and, I think we, we ought to have that on all levels from university lodges to, you know, back in the old days, there was the railroad lodge, there was the doctor lodge and so on and so forth. Oh, kind of like of an like an affinity almost. Yeah, exactly. Um, and there's um, there was actually a um, order called the Order of Judas Maccabeus, which I'm I've been researching on and off for almost as long as I've been a Mason (laughs) and uh, it was designed in New York as a response to the Knights Templar because you had to be a Christian to join the Knights Templar. And uh, this was designed for non-Christian brethren uh, to be kind of that chivalric experience and um, have a lot of fun with it and not, uh, not miss out. That's what, that's what I think. Instead of an order that has required the Christian faith since its beginning change, things like that should be revived if the demand is there. And I, I think the demand is there. You know what I mean? And I, I know uh, a couple brothers in uh, New York that went and got their Royal Arch degrees um, specifically so that they could try and work on reviving this order. And so, I mean, if they ever get it running off the ground, I'd love to go visit them and receive those degrees and take it back to Texas, because I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of market for that, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. I'd love to see that kind of get started up because the, the whole idea of chivalric degrees is really cool. Um, oh God, masonry is just kind of awesome in general. And, uh, so I don't know, the, the more, the better. I, it, there's a huge demand for that. I know the there, so there's like a club to where they dress in knights and do fights and all that kind of stuff. They're actually holding their grand event at our temple this year, at some point in October. I um, gotta get in on this. Jason Haddock's a member of it, but they have a royal society, the whole shooting match where they reenact those old and so there's a huge demand for that chivalric uh, activity. There's no doubt. And I mean, I'm, I'm always surprised at how popular the Knights Templars are here. Yep. I just think about the, the funny hats. Hey, the funny <laughs> hats are great. We'll get you, we'll get you wearing one of the, one of those one day. That'll be good. And if you don't want to wear a funny hat, if you don't want to wear a funny hat, you can just wear a black suit. 
<laughs> Ricky <laughs> cracks me up too with his because you know you, if you ever see a picture of Ricky and his get up next to uh, another Knights Templar, his chapeau is all puffed and like it just came out of the salon. <laughs> And everybody else is all flat with the part in the middle. <laughs> Those things are great. So do we want to talk uh, about the main episode content? I'm ready if that's the last one. Yeah, that's that's the one for timekeeping purposes. Uh, you know, just kind of, we have went a little long. Sounds um, good. So we're going to be chatting about the EA today, right? Yes, we are. We're going to talk about mostly monitorial stuff. Um, you know, we're going to try and, uh, you know, a standard disclaimer applies. We're going to go try and work off of written text as opposed to anything that's ciphered or, you know, you know, not written down. Because uh, technically <clears throat> the cipher isn't supposed to exist either. So, but we're going to go with everything that's plain text. And so... In Texas law, we won't be violating any secrecy rules. No, absolutely not. Yeah, we'll do our best. Everything we're going to talk about is written. So what did we say we're going to call this one? Uh, Masonic Symbolism 101? Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Sweet. Awesome. What you said, Cypher Book, I did hear that that is in publication. Yes, it should be released around January. Mm-hmm. It will not be sold by Grand Lodge. You get it on Amazon or Barnes and Nobles. I tell you, man, and, uh, they're missing out. They're missing out. It could be a good fundraiser. Well, come to find out, because I asked that question to the uh, so well, some well informed brethren, and they Grand Lodge gets the proceeds, a big cut of that. Oh, okay. So while the publishing company gets their cut and everything else, Grand Lodge will make money off of this. They're just not going to sell it. <laughs> Fair enough. Because right. essentially they're the author of it. You know what I mean? <clears throat> so they get royalties, I guess. Which is a good thing. That is a good thing. So that one's supposed to be corrected. Anywho, where are we going to start at? I think I'd like to kind of our uh, talk about the preparation of the candidate. And so that's such a good one because that's so overlooked. It's like so many lodges, they'll take the candidate and put him in a, a room and get that little cassette player. Have you ever seen this before? I have seen people sleeping it's next got to the, the cassette player. <laughs> Some will have it on CD, but usually it's an old cassette tape that they'll put in and it's the one little speaker, press play, turn it up. And it's, uh, I don't remember whose voice it is. Past Grandmaster. Maybe Jack Kelly. I've never listened to I'm it not in sure. full. It seems like every, everybody yeah. else seems to do it. Um, which It's tough, man. But, uh, yeah, everybody else seems to play the the um, the recording for the candidates, and I don't think we've ever done that. I don't know. Uh, I, no. I never encountered That's, it personally. Yeah. You know, and uh, I've just walked past as the, the voice is just kind of going on, and the guy is like, you can – you can just kind of see the guy sitting there going, "Oh God!" <laughs> so, well, he gets that glazed over, and I, you know, there's there's good information in that audio. Um, I would recommend if a lodge really loved it and liked to use it, re-record it with newer equipment to where, you know, you can play it on your phone or whatever. But listen to it with him and have your points to where you pause and you talk about it for a couple of seconds to where you probably couldn't do that on degree night. Um, mm. if he could get there early enough, great, but don't just set him down and then everybody walk off and expect him to stay cool. focused. And then by the time it's degree time, he's already glassy eyed. Yeah. I mean, how, how are you going <laughs> to have him stay awake for the lecture? <laughs> you got it. Oh, lecture time. He's buried. Actually. And, and so I, in a way I'm kind of lost because maybe it's because I started as an out of Mason, not even sure what exactly on that tape um it's that's a good question it it, it just kind of preps them for the degree you know that this is an ancient old for and there's one for each degree before you start in it so it kind of gives that overview that it's not going to be jovial or trifling you know serious stuff in, pay attention go ahead oklahoma we were given a series of books and i think they i've seen 
books for Texas too that are the same way that one is uh, that so we do use those yeah we have the same thing yeah I, th I think we don't use them as much as we should um, uh, I think I have I think I have all four of them because um, there's one for before you're an entered apprentice, after you're an entered apprentice, and then after you're Fellcraft, and then right after you're a Master Mason. Um, no, I, I don't I, think we I make as, use, as much use of them as we should. Well, I can tell you, because it's my responsibility, 99% of the guys get them. Where they end up, I, could, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of interesting if no, we had them like the prepare copy. papers on. Hey, like, what do you think of the of this that you read in that book? But uh... yeah, and see, here's my thing: is about th those books are great and they're part of Grand Lodge law, so you need to be using them. <clears throat> but you, you, this should be done by well informed brethren. Those can be a supplement, but I've read those books and they're good. Don't get me wrong. But for somebody that just really doesn't know what's going on, it could be a little confusing, I guess, or just hard to read. Yeah. I can get that because I remember reading through it the first time. It's like looking back on it, though, it made a lot of sense. But leading up to it, it, it does leave you. It does leave the person with a lot of. Yeah. Because typically they have. They have some idea, but then they have questions that kind of will build up to the next question. And when you just dump the information on them, they really don't know how to process it because Freemasonry, like we talked about before, is revealed in levels. So when you dump level eight on him and he's still trying to figure out level three, it just shoot, one arrow went out the other. That's why the preparation by a mentor or a well-informed brethren is so important. And I say preparation, I mean the months leading up to his EA. Because if you've only known him for a month and a half and he's being initiated after a month and a half after you being have met him, there's no way he can be prepared for that degree. Yeah. It's just... It just doesn't work that way. I mean, what we're doing is so deep and so should be so life changing, but it takes time to get him to that point. And when we rush them in, we're kind of robbing them of that experience because they're just like, they just got level 14 and they're back on level two. It's like that, that makes no sense to me. <laughs> yeah. And it, it seems simple to us because we've been steeped in it. You know what I mean? We, we, we got it. I've been a Mason for a few years now. Yeah, uh, let, let's talk about the physical preparation. One of the things that uh, Lightfoot starts off with is uh, one of the chapters of his commentaries. It's just titled uh, The Rite of Discalciation. I think I'm, yeah, Discalciation. And so taking your shoes off, you know. Um, so one of the, the idea of footwear and either wearing it or not wearing it is, is important to um, Masonic degrees um, specifically the blue lodge degrees and the Royal arch degree um, discalciation or taking shoes on or off or whatever is pretty important. Um, <clears throat> and in some degrees it's made very clear that it's a, it's kind of a throwback to when Moses a, approach the bone the 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 burning bush uh you know god tells him you know hey like this is holy ground don't wear shoes here and it, it's um the hebrews used to take their shoes off before going into um the temple and that was the only way that you were allowed to and depending on the tradition uh you might still have to uh, in certain places i think part of that goes back to it seems like the custom as far as we've had a religion, right? That there is a clear delineation around in the outside. You have to take off your shoes because you don't want to bring in anything of the outside world. If you look at the, the Talmud, right? In your quote, and I'm, it even mentions, right? There's a big paragraph about how one must, and I think it covers a lot of the preparation 
you get your EA degree. Uh, it says, man must not be frivolous near the eastern gate, for it is near the foundation of the house of the Holy of Holies. One may not enter the Holy Mount with his staff, or with his sandal, or with his belt pouch, or with dust on his feet. Not make it a shortcut. It is forbidden as deduced from lesser to greater. You know, I listened to a podcast, not I think it was Radio Lab. I can't remember which one, but uh, they talked about a lot of these traditions in religion, like uh, taking off your shoes. You had to wash so many times to be cleansed. Uh, you couldn't eat pigs. Uh, there's a couple others that were co- all kind of rooted in as well as a um, health issue. You didn't wear your shoes in because nobody cleaned up all the dung everywhere. And you couldn't have your house full of dung because you couldn't just sweep it out. I mean, it was a dirt floor. So you could track in whatever kind of horse, yeah, cow, whatever. Stuff. You got it. And pigs, you know, they were they were notorious for trichinosis back in those days to where they didn't know to cook it to 210 degrees or whatever. You know what I'm saying? To cook out the trichinosis. So you just didn't eat pig. Right. It was, it was, it was a filthy creature. Um, you got it. <laughs> Well, and so that kind of goes really with, interesting. with like ritual washing as well. And that's, we mm-hmm. don't do, we don't do ritual washing in Blue Lodge or anything like that. But, um, there are certain, no, I, there are certain I, I, degrees where you wash your hands, that kind of thing. Um, but you don't really see that in Blue, Blue Lodge. But, um, for example, when, uh, a Muslim is going to, uh, worship before entering, uh, the specific worship area of the mosque, they have to take off their shoes and um, they have to uh, wash their, I know their hands and forearms and I think maybe also their faces as well. But, uh, and I was actually told that's one of the reasons why um, I was talking with a Muslim buddy of mine and he said, that's one of the reasons why some mosques, if I went and visited a mosque, some might object to me visiting because I'm covered in tattoos and the ritualistic washing is meant to purify you. And if it's in your skin, you can't purify that, which that's kind of a side note, but I thought it was, it's, it's interesting because you're tracking things in, you know? So if if you have, you know, something in your skin, you're still tracking it in. Um, He's in switch tattoos. I know. (laughs) (laughs) What's that? It is interesting too, because I, I've had several Muslim friends and I've, I've talked at length to them about the whole preparation before. Uh, and for them, you're right. So they do wash their hands and their feet and their forearms and their faces. Uh, they even go so far as to, you have to snort water into your nostrils and blow it out to even get the dust out of, out of your nostrils. Awesome. That's hardcore. That's awesome. <laughs> You know, something else I wanted to say about the route of dis- discilliation, however you pronounce it. Um, discalcination. Yeah. Or discalciation, uh, sorry. I'm saying it wrong, too. <laughs> no, trust me. I've had several different pronunciations of it. I need to actually look it up and figure it out. But, um, you know, the, it was something that really dawned on me, because nowadays you talk about uh, giving somebody your shoe. That's like no big deal today. You know, that that was the way they sealed the deal in the old days. Like, I'm serious about this. If you want to know how serious I am, here's my shoe. <laughs> yeah. And it seems so weird because we all have at least three or four pairs of shoes. And back in those days, it wasn't that easy. You were lucky so that you had one. serious business. Yeah. So that's – and here's a couple of, uh, couple of the different biblical passages relating to discalciation. You know, so um, Exodus 5, or no, sorry, Exodus 3, um, passage 5, you know, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes off from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And that's what God is talking to Moses, right? He's, you know, the burning bush, and he's like, yo, like, back up. Um, in Joshua 5, uh, and the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And uh, in Ecclesiastes 5, uh, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of the of God. And so, um, it's one of those uh, customs that 
it seems to kind of have predated the written format of the Bible, right? Because, you know, Lightfoot talks about it, you know, he talks about it having existed since time immemorial and all that. But it's one of those cultural practices, which from a religious standpoint really does, like, from a practical standpoint really makes a lot of sense. And from a religious standpoint in terms of um, spiritual cleansing also makes a lot of sense. But um, yeah, it's kind of cool. Um, it seems to be primarily a Middle Eastern thing, um, but uh, it, it's, you know, through virtue of masonry being based on Abrahamic faith, it, you know, obviously that's going to carry over. But uh, Absolutely. Let's see. Then look how many people ask you to take off your shoes. Else too, you know. Not that's, only is it a sign yeah. of cleanliness in way it's a sign of respect and i know there's some countries where it's really weird if you don't take your shoes off you know uh when i lived in germany for a while and that's standard practice like you have a little uh shoe schrank you know it's like um i don't know like a little shelf that you put shoes in and either you walk around in socks or you have like a little set of house shoes you know and they're just usually slippers or something but um Mm -hmm. Most yeah, it was, it countries. was the same way in the Philippines too. So let's talk about the blindfold, right? And we don't, you know, we don't call it a blindfold. What do we call it, Rit? Hoodwink. Right. Which <laughs> so, you know, Robert Hurd's got a great uh, in his book, the Initiatic Experience. He talks about that, or maybe he's talked about this at our lecture, to where the hoodwink wasn't a blindfold; it was something that went over your whole head. Like a bag. Yeah. I mean, it looks like one of those giant executioner's bag type things that uh, um, they, you know, they would put, you, you see in the movies before they behead you or whatever, that's just a giant <laughs> bag, which that's dark, but whatever. Well, I mean, that's kind of the thing that he talked about is that, you know, during a degree, you should feel un- a little uncomfortable. You know, to where you're questioning things, you're on alert, you're really soaking things into where your senses are popping. And if you're totally relaxed and, you know, just like, oh, this is no big deal, your senses aren't picking things up like they are to where, you know, if you're out camping and you think you hear something around creeping around behind you, all of a sudden you can hear a cricket moving. Yeah. You know, as my grandpa would say, you could hear a mouse peeing on cotton at that point. <laughs> <laughs> That's you really know, specific. <laughs> so it was full of those euphemisms. But uh, your senses get, you know, kind of riled up to where you're more in tune with your environment and not to a point to where you're scared. But you're just like, hey, I need to be paying attention right now. And the hoodwink over your whole face and head can kind of get you in that direction. I think if you did it here in Texas, you might have to explain yourself, Lucy. Oh, I'd, but, I'd love to start using a full hood wave. That'd be, <laughs> that, that'd be crazy. It'd be awesome. You know? Yeah. And it'd actually be a lot more convenient as the senior deacon. Um, but anyway, <laughs> so the Lightfoot's got some really good material on the hoodwink. And um, he talks about like different lengths of um, time that people wear the hoodwink. And, you know, as as Masons, we only wear it for a couple minutes. You know, it's not that long. Um, but uh, he talks about, uh, here's the, the, the one, of, one quote he's got. In the ancient mysteries, the aspirant was always shrouded in darkness as a preparatory step to the reception of the full light of knowledge. The time of this confinement in darkness and solitude varied in the different mysteries. Among the Druids of Britain... The period was nine days and nights. In the Grecian mysteries, it was three times nine days. While among the Persians, according to Porphyry, (laughs) I don't know, it was extended to be the almost incredible period of 50 days of darkness, solitude, and fasting. So uh, some people take it a lot, you know, the old old school groups used to take it a lot more seriously than we do. (laughs) That's funny that that ties into the blindfold. Or hoodwink. Yeah. I'm fasting. It's, it's really neat. Um and that's one of the one of the objections I've heard from some kind of more conservative Christian groups, you know, 
um, was that, um, you know, we, we talk about bringing somebody from darkness to light and, uh, the, the objection there is, well, you know, you can't bring somebody from darkness to light because they were all always in, you know, they were always in Jesus's light and everything like that. And, um, yeah, we're I mean, talking about a different kind of light, though. That's salvation. They, yeah, it's salvation. And that's one of those things yeah. that I think people get confused. We're not mm-hmm. When we're talking about light, we're not talking about salvation. Masonry can't save you. That's between you and God. Yeah, we're uh, talking about uh, the mysteries. knowledge. Yeah. yeah. We're talking Wisdom. about the mysteries. And, and um, It's funny. I went on a camping trip with my son for school, and <clears throat> they took us out in total darkness. And... Had us uh, cover one eye, and maybe y'all have heard of this, kind of goes back to the pirate days, and then they shined a flashlight in our eye, or just kind of put some light on to where one eye had been in total darkness for like 15 minutes as we walked around the woods, and then the other one had had the flash of light in it. So we looked around with our eyes still covered, and you, you could see a little bit, but then we covered that eye that had light and opened the other one that didn't. And it was like you had night goggles on. Yeah, it's pretty so, cool. Yeah, so while you were still in the dark, you could see a lot better because there's always light present. And uh, it, it kind of, I mean, instantly hit me. It's like, oh, that kind of ties into the hoodwink, you know. Uh, if you Even if you were brought to light in a dark room, if it had just a hint of light, you would still be able to see very well. Yep. Well, that's why your one of my- eyes are too. Since becoming a Mason, one of my favorite facial expressions has become startled blinking. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah. if they're coming to light with an assault, you know, to where they have to be like, oh, my God, this room's so bright. It is too bright in there. You need yeah. to bring it down a little bit for their experience because you think, oh, it's too dark for them to see what's going on. They've been hoodwinked for 15 minutes or so, 10 maybe. Uh, their eyes are ready to see in the dark. Yeah, because there's light. There's nothing that's absolutely dark. Well, and he, Lightfoot's got another quote. Well, and actually from Oliver, but you know he, it, we're talking about that the level of light, and it should be dark in there. Um, he says in Doctor Oliver's Signs and Symbols, there is a lecture on the mysterious darkness of the third degree. This refers to the ceremony of enveloping the room in darkness when that degree is conferred. A ceremony once always observed, but now, in this country at least, frequently, but improperly, omitted. The darkness here is a symbol of death, the lesson taught in the degree, while the subsequent renewal of light refers to that other and subsequent lesson of eternal life. So, you know, it used to be pretty standard practice that you would be doing this stuff in low light. and uh, Well, I mean, what would they light the room with anyway? Right. Candles. Yeah would be real dark in there. So it seems weird to me that we try to get it as bright in there as possible. I mean, you should have stated meeting lights and degree light. You know, it's brought down a little bit, um, but to each their own. The whole point of darkness and even the blindfold in the beginning, luckily, I, I think to about in the beginning was the word, right? And you omit vision you focus only on the word the words take on a greater importance you don't have your eyes to give you or to bring in anything else that's all you have so in a way it's almost like going back to the bible the beginning there was the word you have you just no i think that's a great point because your eyes can pollute you you know i like when i'm doing a degree and i mess up i try my hardest not to roll my eyes at myself, I guess. But my body puts off an expression that I just goofed up. While you, I've gotten good to where you can't tell, I'll keep rolling to the next part. But uh, if you could see me, you're more likely to realize that I probably just messed up. Solution, and get if you good. Got, <laughs> yeah, if you got your eyes covered, you're right. You're just hearing the words. And your your eyes aren't polluting you in that way, so that's a great point. Yeah, the um, and I, I kind of want to move on to the cable toe. Uh, Do it, the cable toe. The uh, <laughs> now, the cable toe for <laughs> you know I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail for it, but like as an entered apprentice when or as a 
candidate for the internet apprentice degree. I walked into the prep room and I was like, what the hell is that? Um, cause it looks like a big old noose. Um, and, uh, it, it's, it's very interesting because we talk about the candidate, you know, the candidate should feel uncomfortable and, um, presenting them with strange unexplained objects is kind of important, I think. Um, and the, the cable toe really does fit in with that. Um, and it, you know, we talk about within the length of your cable toe and, uh, the, I'm trying to that think one's this. my favorite. The length of the cable I've toe heard, is flexible. <laughs> so. Well, and I've heard people specifically ask how many miles does that mean? I was like, what? It is, uh, because apparently back, it is three miles when you were riding by buggy yeah. and I've heard people argue that it's like 80 miles now. I yeah. was like, I don't think that's what it means. So it's like, if you can was, do it. Yeah, this was actually changed. So it, well, the Baltimore Convention of 1842 actually defined the length of a cable toe. And it's within, uh, it says, um, and as it was defined in the Baltimore Convention of 1842, 42 means the scope of a man's reasonable ability. <laughs> That's so perfect. That's exactly right. Yep. So whenever somebody yep. asks you, how long is a cable toe? You say, it's flexible. <laughs> the longer, the better, though. Yeah. So use your gauge, your 24-inch gauge, and get that cable toe as long as you can get it because – I read, I think it's in the symbolism of masonry, a book done by Grand Lodge, that somebody anchored off with a short rope in rough seas, it's more likely to snap. Oh, and wow. somebody that has a longer rope can take those big waves in and out. So when life gets rough, your cable toe, if it's long, you're more likely to get through it, which makes sense, you know. You, you can get yourself out of some real slumps in life by going and giving, working in the soup kitchen, whatever it may be, you know? Yeah. The, so. um, the only, so we never really specifically define how long the cable toe is. And obviously we have that, um, that flexible requirement. The only degree that I can think of right now, and I'm probably wrong, um, that I've taken that has a uh, specific length for the cable toe is the Knights Templar degree. And so that one actually does spell out like how long your cable toe is, um, which I always thought was kind of interesting. But uh, yeah, it's flexible, y'all. Don't worry about it. <laughs> the longer, the better. <laughs> the longer, the better, the better. But some of us do have really short cable toes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, and I, I'm talking in generalities, uh, not just specifically masonry, but, you know, your cable toe can apply to many different areas of your, just be willing to help. It's basically what I'm getting at. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that is important too, that it, it really shouldn't be based on, do I feel like doing this or not feel like doing this? It should be, am I, you know, is it within my ability to do this? So that won't, you know, me into a serious bind myself. That's a perfect way to put it. So you had plans of watching college football all day Saturday and a brother post that, hey, I need some help. This has happened. And you're like, oh, man. But if your ability permits, you should hop up and go. Yep. Yep. And a lot of times that's the biggest factor there is family. Like, you know, um, if, uh, you know, if you've been to Lodge four times <laughs> this week and, you plan to watch college football with your wife, uh, who is also a graduate of that university or, you know, or you were going to take your kids to go somewhere, you know, then your cable toe is shorter and that's okay. You know? Um, Amen. So that's it. it it's, it's all about judging reasonably. <laughs> so, yeah. But, uh, let, let's talk about prayer, right? Yes. And I know, Rit, you like this to pray. This one is my favorite. And if you haven't, if you're a Mason and you haven't picked up on how important prayer is to us, you, you need to go do it, watch a couple of degrees again. Um, I love 
the part in the, you know, because right from the get go in the EA, it's explained how important it is. But in the master's degree, it drives it home hardcore that there is no limit. You know, if you need help or, you know, I say help, that's such a misnomer because you should pray for anything and everything you can think of. You know, because I see it more as a moment to where it allows you to quieten your mind and awaken the ideas to where a solution will start to appear. Yeah, and sometimes that solution is stop this, you know. Um, uh, Interesting conversation that I I had um, following a a sermon at church. You know, I was talking with a pastor afterwards, and he says, yeah, you know, sometimes the ugly reality is that the answer to a question is no. Oh, you know, is no. (laughs) And uh, sometimes the answer to a prayer is no. Um, So uh, that's not quite the lesson that we teach in Blue Lodge necessarily, but, you know, it's one of those things, important things to remember. Absolutely it is. So when I was reading uh, that section in the Talmud from the Mishnah, it did actually mention prayer um, thinking about it because when you think about it every one of our meetings we have prayer twice we begin with prayer we end with prayer uh, and it makes sense that it's part of the initiation also that the candidate is at the beginning because he wasn't there for the one in the um, itself oh. was open but it says in there, one who enters a fortified city should pray twice, once on his entrance and once on his exit. He should give thanks for what is past and then supplicate for the future. The part of prayer here also kind of plays into that um, ancient scripture. Definitely should be a part of a major part of a Masonic toolbox is prayer. <laughs> and it's one of those things that it's it's it. Prayer is both, like, even looking at prayer from a purely secular standpoint, right? Let's let's take, you know, let's take God out of the equation, right? Which is kind Mm -hmm. of a weird thing to say about prayer. But when you pray, it makes you think about the things you're praying about. Not, you know, I mean, obviously you had to think about them in order to uh, pray for them. But it, it, it stirs further thought in your mind of those ideas. And then, you know, if you've ever done a free-form prayer where, you know, somebody's like, hey, man, like, could you bless this food before we open up? And, like, you're not prepared. And all of a sudden you start, you find yourself just tacking things on that you were just like, wow, yeah, like, I was thinking about that. And, like, let's talk, you know, let's pray for these people. Let's pray for that. Let's pray for this. All of that is stuff that has, it's been floating around in your mind. Mm -hmm. And it didn't come to the forefront until somebody asked you to say a prayer. And so it's important. It's an organizational tool. Um, uh, you know, from a purely, purely secu- secular standpoint, it's a reflective meditative practice that everybody should be engaging, um, just to organize yourself. Um, obviously as a, as a religious practice, it, there's a whole lot more to it than that, but it makes you think. No, yeah, you're right. I mean, cause organizational tools, great because typically when people fall back to prayer, it's their last resort. You know what I mean? They they haven't been able to come up with a solution on their own. And usually it's because it's such a massive problem that it's just overwhelmed them with, I have a problem, I have a problem. So your mind's just thinking about the problem. And when you resort to prayer, you're reaching out for a solution. So the first time the frame of mind of creating a solution has been cracked. And then the solutions will start to reveal themselves because you're not thinking about the problem all the time. You've switched and turned on that law of attraction for the solution as opposed to the problem. You know, obviously, as Masons, like, you know, one of the uh, things that we do for the reason for prayer is that if, if you don't believe in God, then prayer you're not really going to be feel, feeling comfortable with that. And if you feel really uncomfortable with the idea of prayer um, in front of a, a bunch of other brothers, then maybe that tells you that maybe this isn't right for you. So that's just one of those, it's one of those little litmus test things. You got it. Cause yeah, if you can't ask for help from the big man, you're not going to be willing to ask for help for your brothers. And that's part of the fraternity is allowing your brothers to help you. Because 
if nobody asked for help, we wouldn't have a, you know, the core basis of our fraternity wouldn't even be there. Yeah, the and I want to read the the last paragraph that Lightfoot wrote on prayer. And cuz and I'm I'm leaning heavy on Lightfoot here, but I mean, we're talking about the symbolism of the degrees in Texas and there's nobody better to uh, for, to go to for that than Lightfoot, mm-hmm. but uh, it's the last paragraph and it's masonry neither usurps the place of nor imitates religion. Prayer is an essential part of our ceremonies. It is the aspiration of the soul toward the absolute and infinite intelligence, which is the one supreme deity. Certain faculties of man are directed toward the unknown. Thought, meditation, prayer. Thought, meditation, and prayer are great mysterious pointings of the needle. It is a spiritual magnetism that thus connects the human soul with deity. These magnetic irradiations of the soul cast through the shadow toward the light. It is but a shallow scoff to say that prayer is absurd because it is not for us, by means of it, to persuade God to change his plans. Prayer is a force. Why should it not be the law of God that prayer, like faith and love, should have its effect? To deny the effect of prayer is to deny that of faith, love, and effort. And that last sentence just blows me away. It's just one of those things that, yeah, if we don't believe in prayer, then we really can't. It's. I'm not saying it's the cornerstone for belief in God, but it's one of those things that it, it's a yeah, duh kind of moment. Like, well, uh, if I can't believe in prayer, then I really can't believe in anything else working out for me in terms of yeah. my, my relationship with God. So, but yes, yeah, let, let, let's talk about the rite of circumambulation. And I know <laughs> Billy was doing some research on this and Rit, you got your own point on this, uh, related to Lightfoot's and some diagrams, but, um, Billy, can you tell us about what you were reading? So, uh, on circumambulation, I found in Scottish folklore that to move sunward or clockwise was considered the prosperous course. Uh, In turning from east to west in the direction of the sun, the Druids would actually walk around their temples, always keeping the temple on their right. Uh, And there's several different thoughts as to why this was. It could be because of the motion of the sun on sundials in the northern hemisphere. The the move from left to right. uh, Or it could be because of the right-hand bias that we find in many cultures. Uh, in this right-hand bias, right, uh, even Aristotle wrote about it in his second book of Decilo. I'm not sure the pronunciation for that, but he says, right is the place in which motion through space begins and diurnal motion of the heavens around the motionless earth is circular motion to the right. It, it makes me wonder if it does harken back to those ancient concepts that you know, moving to the right was always the preferential course. Oh. You can even see it in Dante, right? When you read Dante's Inferno, as he descends through the layers of hell, he always goes to the left. Uh, and it's he only turns to go to the right to ascend. I, I think there are two other times in when he's in hell, when he turns to the right. Um, so it, it's not a exact always happening kind of rule but as a generality he always turns to the left to descend always turns to the right to ascend that's really interesting that you use that phrasing because it makes me think of royal arch uh, <laughs> that's cool <laughs> all right um no i i dig circumambulation because you know when i first came in the first few years i never that term you know, I think it was three or four years in at best guess. Um, and the first time it, I heard it, I was like, wait a second. Yeah. Cause they talked about it referring to us walking in circles in the lodge. I was like, if it's got a name like that on it, it's got to have something deep attached to it. Aside from just making sure that the, uh, brethren there are satisfied with the guy, you know, kind of like <laughs> walking him around as a show cattle, you know? Is everybody cool with this guy? Yeah, <laughs> this guy. Right. Yeah, you know, and actually, in, in some of the older um, like exposés, um, there's one of them from the 1700s that it mentions that that's also an important part of why they walk the candidate around the lodge, is that everyone can see that they are actually a man and they're they're not a woman trying to sneak into the lodge. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, well, and I can tell you one experience my grandfather told me about in Lodge that uh, uh, someone petitioned. And, you know, we have to have no physical maims or defects. If we do, it has to be approved by the Grand Master. So there's forms you fill out. Hey, he's missing a finger, an arm, whatever it may be, some kind of appendage. Well, this guy was missing a toe and nobody knew it. And they stopped the degree and went back and followed the proper protocol and got dispensation. So, you know, it has its purpose. And I believe that is that's like anything that we do in Lodge. It has this initial purpose and then layered on through there's deeper and deeper meaning until eventually you get on your own interpretation. But uh, on the surface, that first reasoning behind circumambulation is to make sure because I don't necessarily yeah. like to admit it, but there's been times when we've done a fellow craft degree and we're doing the circumambulation and somebody taps me on the shoulder and goes, he needs an apron. Oh gosh. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's happened a couple times. Yeah. And that's the moment for everybody to be looking for those things. Hey, that that's on the wrong foot or, you know, it's supposed to be three times, not two times, you know, all kinds of things that could go wrong that that's the moment to correct them. But yeah. it certainly goes much deeper than that, you know, because, of course, you're being led around in darkness, which we have meaning behind that in our questions and answers. Um, mm-hmm. But I really, through my research, found the most power behind it in the sense that you're creating momentum for the degree. This is where the rubber meets the road and you start, things should start happening for this candidate. Yeah. You know, uh, charging it up like a dynamo. It's exactly right. You know, just like a merry-go-round, the first couple of turns around are slow and hard, but eventually once you get that thing spinning, you can keep it going easy. And that's essentially what the circumambulation, those first little push well, that's one thing that I noticed when I'm doing the senior deacon part. You know, I'm conducting the candidate about the lodge room. For EA degrees, it's always a slow go. Um, for master's degrees, man, we're charging around the lodge room. And that's not even me. That's mostly the candidate. Just, he, you know, he's just going. And uh, Yes. But one of the neat things I really like about circumambulation is that, you know, circumambulation always occurs in one direction. Um, and the same side of the candidate is always facing the altar. The, you know, the senior deacon stands on your left side and your right side is always facing the altar. And I thought that was really interesting because, and somebody said, well, you know, why, you know, why do you have your right side always facing the, um, the altar? And I said, well, it's good. You know, your right side, that's the, you know, side that's, you know, you swear oaths with and everything like that, of, of, of course it's going to be facing the altar with the Bible on it. And somebody said, well, yeah, but think about it. You know, the left hand was always considered the weaker side, right? So your senior deacon is protecting your weaker side because your your strong side is facing the Holy Bible, um, uh, but uh, your weak side is exposed to the darkness, so to speak. So if the the Holy Bible is the great light, then your left side is kind of hanging out in the shadow. And that's why mm. you have the senior deacon guarding your left side. That's a great point. Yeah, I've never heard right, that, that before. Was cool. um, and, then I, and then when somebody was saying that, I um, re- realized, I had the realization that in the master's degree, there is one circumambulation, which we're not going to go into detail in, but you take it in the opposite direction than you normally would. Mm-hmm. But even even during that circumambulation, your right side is still facing uh, the Holy Bible uh, uh, square. That's opposites. right. Yeah, and yep. uh, there are there are only certain people that don't uh, face the Holy Bible with their um, right side. So I thought that was really interesting. And I obviously can't go on air, can't go into too much detail because that's that's actual degree work there. But I thought that was kind of super cool. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. That's a great point. Absolutely right. Your right side is always on the altar, even when you're being worked in reverse. 
It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and um, I mean, we and there's so much going on in that, like the circumambulation. Like, you can look at it as, um, you know, if each position of the, you know, if each principal officer position represents a time of day, whether it's you know morning, noon, and night, uh, or morning, noon, and uh, sunset, you know, um, then if you have the north representing nighttime then every time you circumambulate, you're passing through a day. You know, it's just super cool. Like, there, the circumambulation just goes and goes, and it, it there's a lot of meaning to it, you know? It's not just Absolutely. Around. No, not at all. I mean, uh, Billy and I were talking at it, about it at the cook-off, you know, that I've, I've read of it being equated to the labyrinth, that you know they used to walk oh, yeah. to meditate in a way to kind of figure out problems and contemplate deep questions, you know, because the labyrinth will lead you in, it'll take you to the very center, and then back out, and so on and so forth. As opposed to a maze, you could end up nowhere. Uh, labyrinth has a defined entry and a defined end; you just have to follow the path. And it had a lot of correlation with that in a sense that it was that moment to clear your mind and let the let the light in, the solutions in. It's interesting stuff. Uh, it, it, and funny enough, it, it always reminds me of uh, Jim Morrison's Walk About in the Desert. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he came back a different guy for sure. Um, and that's kind of an extreme example, but... Um, I've always been a fan of his. Yeah. We're not trying to get uh, people it was, to become you know, a lizard king or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the walkabout or in that moment to get out and clear your mind has been in culture since the beginning of time. You know, well, it may and, not and, have been necessarily a circle, but still the same concept. But usually a circle of some kind and, and almost you know, always turning to the right. Like the the Greeks did this, the Romans did this. Uh, you know, the, the Hindus did this, uh, you know, the Druids did this. I mean, it goes back and back and back and back. I I was just going to say, and you had even mentioned like, uh, the Aboriginal culture in their, their walkabout, uh, the process they had for that. It's very related to it as well. You know, that process of clearing your mind, taking the mm -hmm. journey to, to, I guess, purge yourself in a way. No, this is exactly. So, uh, I think one of the examples about that uh the aborigines using it you know they would have the shaman that if the tribe had a problem and they weren't able to i think it was food that they weren't able to find so he went on a walkabout to clear his mind and came back he's like hey look we got to move the tribe southeast this far and set up camp again and go hunting and we should be able to kill something and all of that came to him in a walkabout that's you powerful know, right there. Exactly. You know, so that was one guy's uh, claim to the origins of circumambulation, which I don't think, I think it's one of those things you really can't tack down because um, I think it's one of those eternal truths that just kind of bleeds into every culture, whether you had contact or not. Same thing with like the golden ratio, mm. you know, you didn't, you didn't necessarily have to be taught culture by culture. It just, happened in epiphanies yeah i'm gonna go with many i'm gonna go with this is one of those since time immemorial things <laughs> you got it <laughs> across all cultures uh, and it also plays into like story archetypes right in that this would be the warrior's journey oh yeah absolutely yes which that's what it's all about anyway you know that's that's part of what makes it so crucial to our degree, before the real journey begins, you you have to circumambulate or you have to be trained. Guys, this has been really cool. I think we made a lot more thorough progress than I was expecting. So we're actually <laughs> going to have to split 101 into probably 101 and 102. Um, maybe 103 as well. But uh, yeah, so we're, we have a lot of material to cover. Um, I think that's a great idea. Um uh, we can pick up where we left off if we don't have a guest pop up. But even so, we'll we'll just make do sure it whenever. Keep going. You got it. This would this week's fraternal quote is kind of long, but it's good. 
And it's, um, any inquiry into the symbolism and philosophy of Freemasonry must necessarily be preceded by a brief investigation of the origin and history of the institution. Ancient and universal as it is, whence did it arise? What were the accidents connected with its birth? From what kindred or similar association did it spring? Or was it original and anti auto -cathonic? I don't know how to say that. Or was it original and auto independent in its inception of any external influences and unconnected with any other institution? These are questions which an intelligent investigator will be disposed to propound in the very commencement of the inquiry, and they are questions which must be distinctly answered before he can expe be expected to comprehend its true character as a symbolic institution. He must know something of its antecedents before he can appreciate its character. And that mouthful is the first paragraph of the book The Symbolism of Freemasonry by Brother Albert G. Mackey. So, and he's the guy uh, that gave us Mackey's Encyclopedia and all that jazz. So he's very knowledgeable, to say the least. No, and I love that quote that because it, it, it really, to me, spoke to how this thing is layered. There's prerequisites to things you have to learn before you can learn the next step. And we as brethren and Masons already have to be aware of that system and the layers that are there so we can teach it properly. You know, I see it happen so many times where we get excited and jump to the deep end of the pool when we haven't taught this guy how to tread water yet. So, you know, be mindful. And if you're not aware, of it, just start reading. It'll reveal itself to you. It'll come to you. Listen to more podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's where we'll get our light. <laughs> Billy, Billy no, do you no. have any closing thoughts? So the study of symbolism in Masonry, it, it's not something that comes easy. Definitely well worth studying. And it's not something that you'll understand years on the road. I mean, it, it takes serious study, but I, I think it's so worth it. Um, myself, I, I was made a Mason 21 years ago. Uh, and I wasn't a Mason, the in, wasn't active the entire time. But even after all that time, I still find stuff that just blows my mind. Uh, so every Mason, I, I think they owe it to themselves to look into the symbolism uh, behind what went into their degrees, what goes into the rituals, and look for something that resonates within them because there are valuable lessons to learn there. Uh, and if you don't look into that symbolism, I think in a way you kind of shortchange yourself and, and your Masonic experience. 100%. Yeah. I mean, how's it going to be revealed to you if you don't start hunting? Yeah. And that kind of one of those things that uh, that really hammers this home uh, for any Masons that are member, also members of a cryptic council. The uh, uh, council summary, which is given at the end of the select degree or the select master degree, uh, talks about each degree in, you know, summarizes it and then talks about, well, you know, we kind of hope that you studied and learned and all this, but it actually, it actually goes so far as to say that, um, you know, we, we trust that you've entered into the, the full spirit of those solemn ceremonies and learned the full meaning of, uh, those important symbols. And it says for then and only then, can you claim that friendship, that union, that fervency and zeal, that purity of heart, uh, and goes on and on. And, and it goes, you know, hey, like, if you haven't learned anything, then you don't really get to claim these things, which I thought was interesting and very important. And it, I feel like that's kind of a little bit hardcore in terms of strictness, but it also kind of makes sense because a lot of... A lot of the reasons why we trust each other so much is that we all are kind of on the same boat in terms of, well, we learned these really important lessons. And because of that, I can trust you guys with my life. Yeah. Um, and a, a brother that doesn't understand those, um, you know, it's going to be harder to connect with him because of that. And so, you know, nobody's asking you to become super proficient in ritual or nobody's asking you to write research papers or anything like that. But at the very least you should endeavor to learn these things because uh, there's a reason why we present them 
And um, if if I walk in, you know, if I walk up to somebody and talk about like, you know, and just basic symbolism and they can't explain to me anything, then I go, man, you know, like, can I trust you? <laughs> <laughs> you weren't paying attention at all. It's like, you know, so and yeah. that might be a little bit harsh, but it, it helps to pay attention. Absolutely. I mean, that's the nature of our business. You know, you don't join the geology club and not expect to handle rocks and <laughs> do a little digging. That's you know, astute, this, yeah. yeah, it's just the nature of our, of our business. Yeah. Well, folks, as always, you can find us at www.fortworth148.org. Uh, we are at Fort Worth Lodge 148 on Facebook. Our email is info148 at fortworth148.org. If you live in the 64th District of the Grand Lodge of Texas and you want to promote an event, please reach out to them at 64th.org. That's 64th.org. Well, I have had fun, and now it's time to go get kids ready for school. Absolutely. For the week. Enjoyed it, gentlemen. This is Rip Moore signing off. This is Billy Hamilton signing off. And this is Gabriel Yagish signing off.